Fear is an industry like no other because we're more than just an industry. We're a family. Prior Malt was founded with beer in hand to simply unite people who love craft beer. New brewers are the lifeblood of Cry Malt. So we want to say that we're here for you, no matter what. Cheers. The Cry Malt team, along with our supply partners, have been working round the clock to make sure we can provide you with the very best ingredients for top-notch brews. Because that's what family is for, to be there through the tough times and through the good. Some of our best memories have been made over a few pints at the pub. I can't wait to catch up over a cold one once this is over, but we're still enjoying your beers until then. So from the hop farms in the Pacific Northwest. From the rolling barley fields in Germany. And the great Scottish Highlands here in the UK. And the barley paddocks down under. From the crags of Colorado. And from your local monsters in Australia, we'd like to say... We're here so you can keep making your best beer. Cheers. 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 Flangeva. Cheers. 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 Hello everyone and welcome to the Cryer Malt Virtual Trade Hub, uh, the last day of the Trade Hub during uh, Good Beer Week Virtual Festival. Uh, if you've missed any of the presentations, you can go back uh, onto the YouTube channel that you're on and check them out. Uh, we've, had a, we've had two days of really interesting presentations, so uh, and they'll be up up forever. So um, yeah, if you ever get time to check them out and you've missed one, uh, take the time to look. Uh, and I've got two really special guests um, to present a lot of information about hops to us. Um, I've got Joe Catron and Blaze Rude from Yakima Chief. Joe and Blaze, how are you both? How are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing great. Doing great. Uh, g getting through. <laughs> For sure. Doing well, man. Yeah, we're we're doing good over here, man. We're both in the uh, Pacific Northwest part of the U United States, and it's uh, nice weather out here. It's been it's been good. We're just getting into summer, and it's uh, really nice out. Great. Um, can I, uh, before we start, can I find out what you both do at, uh, at Yakima Chief? Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm Joe. I've uh, been working at Yakima Chief Ranches for uh, eight years now. Um, my title right now is Director of Operations, um, and that, um, that changes from day to day what my duties are. Um, so it really changes with the seasons. So uh, right now, springtime, we're, we're just getting wrapped up with... Uh, Know, finishing off propagation and planting and uh, now a lot of our mature fields are getting trained onto the strings and um, we're getting to the point where you kind of once we get everything on the strings there's a little little moment to exhale there between kind of May and June um, before the growing season starts taking off so um, yeah I handle everything from propagation uh, to uh, a lot of our social media a lot of our brewing relations uh, a lot of our educational outreach and things like this so uh, just real fortunate to be really well connected with both our uh, a group of growers and, and all of our brewing customers. So uh, just feel like a really lucky guy. I love doing my job every day and uh, uh, looking forward to being with you all here this evening. Uh, Blaze, how about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Blaze. I've, uh, I've worked for Yakima Chief Hops now for a little over six years. I've actually worked with Joe in some capacity, I want to say for about 12 years now at first he was yeah. a musician and i was a brewer that was back in the day lots of fun times but uh, at yakima chief hops what i do is a variety of things I've, I've done as much the operations managing our t90 pellet plants product uh innovation now i do brewing innovation and manage sales to uh us key accounts primarily but also uh new to me i'm working with uh james and the crier team down down under so i've uh, been working hard to 
to make sure we have the right hops down there to support the brewing needs of uh, the brewers in, in Australia, New Zealand, and and so on. So uh, done a lot of things, uh, but yeah, I have a knowledge of hop processing, brewing, and then also some of our sales and innovation efforts. Uh, the one key piece I do, I work with Joe and his team on the experimental varieties and um, how we get those to brewers, how we pick which ones to ramp acreage up and um, and how they brew and how, how beer comes out with them. So I do a variety of things. Great, so a lot of hop knowledge on the line at the moment. Um, we've also got James uh, from Yakima Chief, the, the Australian uh, League and Steph from Cryo Malt in the chat there. So um, they're going to be answering any questions and we'll try and get any questions across as we go. So any questions you have, just drop them into the YouTube chat. Uh, we are somewhat pushed for time as well. So um, Joe, I'm going to throw to you. Um, you're going to get a, get up your presentation and, and share the screen and we're going to learn um, a lot more about hops. Absolutely. Now, all right. Perfect. Looks How's great. that looking there, Luke? Yeah, it looks great to us. Um, let me just see if I can reposition things slightly. But, um, yeah, you just go ahead and start chatting. Excellent. Well, again, yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, it's about lunchtime for you all, so it's, I don't know, 15, 17, 20 hours ahead of us. So hopefully you all are better off than we are tomorrow when we show up. Um, but uh, we're just going to give a, a, a quick overview on what we do at Yakima Chief Ranches, um, just to kind of clear up some of the, uh, you know, confusion potentially uh, with the Yakima Chief Ops, Yakima Chief Ranches. We're both um, grower owned entities here in the Yakima Valley, owned by the same, uh, there's three group, uh, three growers that own Yakima Chief Ranches, and then they're uh, part of a larger group of growers that that own and operate Yakima Chief Hops. So really just the, the R&D arm of Yakima Chief supply chain, if you will. Um, so we're very closely uh, connected companies and we're very closely together, uh, but we are two distinct uh, entities. Um, today's presentation is gonna really kind of take you through uh, just uh, our, our brewing program, some of our core competencies as far as developing new varieties and bringing those to market, uh, how we work with our growers to manage those varieties um, in our commercial yards, and then, uh, how those how those hops are are passed through the supply chain onto all of you as as the brewing customers. There we go. Okay, so just real quick, uh, mission, vision, values for Yakima Chief hops. You know, for those of you that are familiar with our supply chain, we are unique in the sense that we are uh, a completely uh, family grower owned entity. Um, that makes us unique, um, you know, compared to any of the competitors in the world. Being owned and operated by uh, family farms is a, a really unique opportunity, uh, a big responsibility to make sure that we are uh, doing the best we can for all of our farmers, but also all of our customers being, being brewers. It's really important uh, that we connect those two entities. And for a long, long time, it was, um, it made a lot of sense for other merchants to keep growers and brewers in a, uh, different rooms, if you will, and really keep a kind of a false wall between those entities. And um, the Yakima Chief supply chain is, uh, really uh, flies in the face of that. And we are very intentional about bringing those, bringing those groups together. And uh, we believe the value um, that is created in that camaraderie uh, best serves both of our industries uh, in a very sustainable, uh, multi-generational uh, type of way. And so that's uh, being multi-generational family farm, it's really important for us to maintain that. And many of you, you know, starting your own family companies and uh, with ambitions of passing those on to, to your kids and grandkids, um, that, that sort of mindset really plays into everything we do every day, uh, Yakima Chief Hops and, and by extension Yakima Chief Ranches as well. So I won't go into all the minutia of that, but really just want to focus on in that mission of connecting Connecting family farms with the world's finest brewers. That's uh, that is our mission. It's something we take very seriously and uh, hang our hat on. So, um, kind of bullet points of the presentation this evening. Um, a little brief overview of what we do at YCR. Some trends in in hop acreage here in the Pacific Northwest, um, and a little bit about the bringing a new a new variety to market and through our uh, hop breeding development cycle. Um, a little bit about our footprints brand management program and that quality that really sets us apart from our competitors. And then uh, 
a bunch of photos really that just kind of take it take you through uh, different propagation techniques and and different points in the season uh, here here in the in the Yakima Valley. Um, for those of you that have never been able to visit a hop farm or never seen hops growing, um, it's I figured it'd just be easier to throw a bunch of photos on there and give a good visual representation, um, and so we can kind of move through that rather quickly. And then uh, hopefully at the end of this, I know we're pressed for time, but we'll. Hopefully save time for some Q&A at the end of Blaze's presentation, and then I will try to uh, get on the YouTube chat as soon as I'm done with this presentation to answer any questions that might come up from this. So a little bit about uh, Yakima Chief Ranches. Uh, we are, uh, like I said, a, a completely grower-owned entity uh, formed, formed in the 80s, um, really with that idea of, of taking a little bit of control back into, into the grower's hands. So uh, historically, a lot of the growers here in the Yakima Valley and, and the Pacific Northwest of the United States in general uh, were predominantly uh, growing uh, alpha varieties. And um, there wasn't a huge demand for aroma, aroma hops around the world like there is today. And so there was a, a couple basically very large multinational companies that, that really had control of the entire hop industry. And um, alpha acid is... Uh, inherently a commodity. It's a commodity market and it probably always will be. And so at that time, a lot of our growers were uh, producing alpha crops uh, at or below the cost of production. And uh, many people were going out of business and there was uh, a lot of different farms buying up smaller farms and some contraction and things were, uh, were not particularly healthy. And so the, the formation of the Yakima Chief supply chain was, was really an answer to that, to really, um, a little bit more value back in the growers pockets and help them build for the future and build their their family farms in a sustainable way and so what they set out to do was create that value in in creating new hop varieties and new ways of doing things so yakima chief ranches um, they hired a man named chuck zimmerman who was a retired hop breeder from the usda who uh, many of you might know is uh, responsible for a lot of those old classic sea hops that we that we all know and love, Cascade, Centennial. Um, a lot of those were, were Chuck's Chuck's crosses when he was working for the USDA. And so when he retired, uh, Yakima Chief Ranches approached him about a kind of a moonlighting opportunity to, to start a private breeding company. And so Chuck Zimmerman uh, was the first breeder for, for Yakima Chief Ranches and uh, had some had some great success and and led to the development of a lot of great varieties um, and also mentored Jason Peralt, who, who is my current boss, the CEO of Yakima Chief Ranches, um, uh, incredibly uh, intelligent and impactful uh, person in, in, the, uh, in the hop and beer worlds, has been um, uh, played a, a large part in bringing a lot of these really great varieties to market, uh, especially aroma varieties uh, over this last decade or so of craft expansion. So this graph here was just a, uh, to show you really how things have changed in, in a fairly short amount of time. Uh, if you look back at just that, that, that green bar there, so each one of these are sets, the alpha aroma and, and, the, and the not reported, basically a very small amount of acres, not reported, uh, mostly spot and alpha, alpha varieties there. But uh, if you look at maybe that green bar there in 2013, it's really about 15,000 acres of each alpha and aroma uh, being grown, being grown in the Pacific Northwest. Um, historically, there, like I said, there was much more alpha being grown. Um, you just look at that from that year, alpha has ebbed and flowed a little bit, dropped down quite a bit in those in the in the middle of the decade there, and then there's been even more alpha uh, acreage going in in the past couple of years. But looking at that aroma acreage, uh, obviously explosive. Um, and every single year over the last five years, we've set uh, acreage and production uh, records here in the U.S. Um, a lot of that on the heels of obviously the craft brewing industry uh, making a lot of hot forward beers. But a lot of that is really a, a testament to a lot of those newer aroma varieties that are coming out of uh, our breeding program here at Yakima Chief Ranches. It's so really why, why is that important? Um, we look that as being a. Uh, a grower owned entity, you know, this, this value that's created in these novel hop varieties comes out of that, that breeding program. So that value that is created is passed from that breeding program onto all of our, all of our farms. You know, uh, 
a lot of people say they, they'll come and visit the farm, they'll go to the experimental yards and we'll take them through and we'll smell some really exceptional hops. And they'll be like, well, that's, that's gotta be the next, that's gotta be the next big thing. That's gotta be the next big thing. And, and really it is, it is really exciting to walk through the experimental yards and, and smell a bunch of unique hops that no one's ever smelled before. No one's ever brewed with before. Um, but it's really got to check a lot of boxes. It can't just be a really novel, exciting aroma. Uh, it really has to perform agronomically. It has to make sense for our farmers to grow it. Uh, it has to make sense um, for our processors. And ultimately, that value, we want to translate all the way through that supply chain. So everything in that circle is, is basically that Yakima Chief supply chain. And then that, ultimately, that, that value is intended to translate in, in the hands of the brewers. And for them to be able to use that value to create uh, value added at beers and, and keep their customers coming back and keep them excited for those, those hot forward beers that they're producing. So really for us, that value creation in the breeding program is, is the genesis and also the, the reason why we continue all of the really stringent quality control parameters that, that we do have here uh, in, in the Yakim Chief supply chain. So transitioning here a little bit into the hot breeding dynamics, um, a little bit uh, of our breeding program. So, you know, you see there in the lower left corner, 11 plus years for commercialization. That's, that's not a typo. It really is about a decade long process um, from, from cross to commercialization, commercialization, excuse me, um, is about, is about a 10 year process. And so year one, as we call it, is when that, uh, that, that cross is actually created. So uh, hops are a dioecious species. They're male and female individuals. Um, there's a few pictures of this later on to give you a better visual representation, but um, we're basically collecting pollen from, from male plants and making controlled crosses uh, onto receptive female plants. And so, you know, if there's people ever say, oh, it's genetically modified, it's, it's not genetically modified whatsoever. It's, it's classical, classical breeding techniques. Uh, we're collecting male pollen and, and applying that to receptive female flowers. Um, and she will subsequently still produce hops, but those hops will be heavily seeded. And so each one of those seeds that comes from those crosses is a, a genetically unique uh, progeny of that cross. And so we will go and harvest those, those cones when they're ready, um, uh, thresh out all of those seeds, and you'll see there in year two, we'll, we'll raise those through the greenhouse through the winter um, after, after we harvest them and screen them for uh, various pests, usually mostly mildews in the greenhouse. Um, and then we will take those and we'll rear those seedlings out. We'll plant those the following year in what we call uh, our seedling plot. And every year that it's about, you know, between uh, 30 and 40,000 uh, unique seedlings every single year come through our program. So um, if, uh, if a particular cross in the seedlings uh, uh, shows some unique attributes um, and cause for, for selection, we can basically go after that first year, um, dig up that, that one little seedling plant and transplant that into what we call single hill. Um, so that's years three, four, and five there where we will grow that plant to a, a full commercial trellis and evaluate it for uh, a holistic criteria, uh, agronomics, harvest date, cone set, uh, pickability, um, cone structure, disease and pest resistance, a whole, a whole litany of things that we'll evaluate, evaluate them for on the farming side. And then um, if they do, if they check all those boxes, even at that point, you know, brewers aren't really quite using them yet. Uh, we don't have enough production that would warrant uh, a full scale, even, even pilot brew really. Um, and so if it makes it through that round, those years three, four and five in single hill, uh, it'll be propagated off of that and, and planted out to uh, seven hills. So we'll take enough planting material to uh, basically finish off of a, a length of a row. And at that point, if, if it's still checking all those agronomic boxes, uh, at that point, we're, we've got enough to where we could send it out to a, a few breweries and have them start playing around with it at, at, at the pilot batch level. Um, and so if, if we start getting buy-in from, from a lot of brewers and people are really getting excited and all of our growers are, are happy to grow it and it's a nice variety form, it, it fits their, their farm, it fits their picking window. Um, 
At that point, we'll, we'll take that seven hill plant and propagate it out to maybe an acre's worth. That's what we call the elite trials, um, where we've got about, a, about an acre of all these uh, experimental varieties where that'll, that'll yield us enough, enough hops to, to get to, in the hands of people like Blaze, who, who are excellent brewers and, and are connected with all of our key accounts and connected with um, a lot of those brewers that are, that are on the cutting edge of using new varieties and, and hop utilization. And, and so it's at that point where we, we get to start having fun with the brewers and getting out in the field and doing collaborations and, and really seeing how these experimental hops perform in beer. Because ultimately, um, you know, there's, there's certain varieties that, that smell really great um, in the field and then for whatever reason, just don't necessarily perform in beer. Uh, conversely, there can be hops that don't necessarily blow your socks off in the field, but for some reason just brew really, really great. And so ultimately it comes down to uh, how, that, how it performs in the brew house. And so at that point, if, if, if we've got people uh, on the farms that are really happy to grow a variety and excited about the prospects, and we've got brewing customers around the world who are excited about how it performs in beer, only at that point would we explore that commercialization. So, so really my boss, Jason, uh, likes to think about it as more of a, a push and pull type scenario where, you know, we've got, like I said, several thousand new uh, unique crosses every single year. And we don't necessarily want to be pushing any new varieties in the market. You know, there's a couple hundred hop varieties in the market to be used already and uh, that make great beer. And um, so we don't really feel the, the, the urge to have to push varieties in the market. We really want our brewing customers to be pulling those new varieties into the market. Um, so at that point, that's uh, that's where basically we would explore with our, our partners at HPC uh, a naming mechanism and, and, and then going ahead and pushing a new variety, uh, a named variety out into the market. So just a few photos here of some of those steps we were just talking about in the breeding program. That's uh, in the left photo there is out at our, at our male plots. And so we uh, are very intentional about keeping our, our male breeding plants uh, separated from our females because in the wild, if they are left to their own devices, the, the males will you know, it, uh, eject pollen and it will be carried with the wind currents and could potentially uh, fertilize females that we don't want them to fertilize. So we keep them isolated. Um, those, the workers there are, are collecting some male flowers. They'll take those into the lab and uh, dry them out for a day or so, and then uh, basically put them through a, a shaker and a sieve and collect the pollen from those male flowers. Uh, we've got a whole library of, of uh, different vials of, of male plants from, from all over the world that we use for our breeding purposes. And so every year, Jason, who's there in, in the right photo, and some of his breeding colleagues will determine what crosses they wanna make for the season. Um, they'll say, I'm gonna take pollen uh, X97 and cross it onto mosaic. And um, so you can see there, uh, they've got a, a portion of that receptive female plant isolated with that bag. And there's a little porthole there where uh, Jason is, is literally just blowing in uh, some pollen uh, for that cross they're making that year. And so you'll uh, keep that, that bag on that portion of the plant throughout the remainder of the growing season. Uh, and, and she will produce hop cones uh, like, like she's supposed to, but the, each one of those cones that's been fertilized will be, will be heavily seeded. And so we'll take and, and collect those seeds from, uh, from those cones that were crossed inside that bag. So you can see there just kind of a couple shots in the greenhouse of uh, get, getting those seedlings germinated. And you can see there in the middle, uh, looks to be probably a downy, a downy mildew. Uh, scourge there in the center photo. So we'll go and, and basically leave everything untreated. And so we can weed out all of the individuals that are susceptible to some of the, the common scourges that we see in hop growing. Uh, if they make it through that, that uh, screening in the greenhouse, they'll be planted out to the seedling plot. So you can see there in that, in the photo on the right, that's our seedling plot. Uh, it's a, it's the short little six, six foot trellis there. Um, and so uh, much different than commercial production that for those of you that have been able to see that before. Uh, but it, it's a, it's an, enough for us to get a, at least one year evaluation on those seedlings uh, and be able to see if they're going to make it next uh, through the next step of selections. So a couple more shots here within the, within the seedling plot. 
Uh, we really, really have to baby these plants along, uh, even, even to get them to sexually express in that first year. So there's a, a minimum number of axillary buds that the, the plant must grow through. So we really got to prune those bottom, those bottom buds and, and, and force the plant to grow as high as we possibly can and then get them to trigger to, to express sexually so we can start to weed out the males from the females at that point. Because at this point, as a seedling, um, we have no idea what the sex of that plant is going to be until it does sexually express. And so there's uh, inherently, you know, roughly half of those plants are going to be males and be eliminated from the breeding program right off the top. Um, so that's kind of the, the steps that we have for our breeding program uh, leading up to the seedlings. And then I explained those next few steps that they had there. If they make it through that round of seedlings, we'll dig up that, uh, that rhizome, which is kind of after one growing season, roughly the size of your fist or so. Uh, so we can easily dig that up and then replant that in our single hill and advanced line plots um, for subsequent, subsequent rounds of selection. Um, so other, other times in the spring, so when we've got uh, just commercial yards and, we're, and you saw the increase in, in acreage over the last, uh, last decade or so roughly. Um, but uh, every spring we are uh, propagating off of existing yards and, and digging roots basically for, uh, for new plantings. And so I've got uh, a bunch of photos here um, that, that will just kind of quickly take us through uh, the growing season. Um, again, I know we're on a time crunch, so if there's any questions, I'd love to answer them at the end. Um, but uh, real quick, just to take you through kind of what it looks like around here in the springtime. Um, so this is a, a commercial yard here of Citra um, that we were digging on this spring. Uh, basically, as soon as, uh, as soon as the snow melts and the ground dries up enough, to get uh, people and implements out in the field. Uh, we've, got, we've got whole crews of people out digging roots. And so they're really, they're going through and they're clearing away the soil uh, off the top of the, all those, those root mounds and uh, physically cutting sections of those rhizomes. So uh, it's kind of a specialized uh, root structure. Um, there's all sorts of different plants in, uh, in the world that their rhizomal plants, hops um, are one of the few that are a crop. Um, but, uh, so basically we're able to take, uh, sections of, of those specialized roots and use those for propagating, uh, new fields. So you can see there, we'll, um, dig those up. They'll cut them into about six inch sections You see those white sections there, the, what we call the eyes. Those are the viable, uh, growing organs of the rhizome. That's what will emerge, uh, from the soil and, and become, and become new binds that, that following year. So we'll take those roots, cut them into sections, uh, count them all up, and we'll take and store them in, in bins, wet them all down, put burlap over them, and keep them, keep them cold, keep them wet, and keep them in the dark. Because um, really, you just want to you want to trick these rhizomes basically into uh, still still being winter. So we're digging these for us. It's it's winter, uh, February. It roughly is kind of rhizome digging season. Like I said, as soon as the snow melts and we're able to get back in the field. So it's still winter time for us. So we'll dig those roots up and, and try to keep them dormant or try to keep them uh, dormant until we're ready to replant those in new fields. So here's an example of a, of a new field being built. Uh, these guys are, looks like they're, they're stretching the, the trellis, the cable across the top of that trellis. And so um, every year you'll see sites like this all across the valley where you know, it looks like this maybe used to be a cornfield, judging by some of the uh, debris in the field. But there's a lot of other uh, a lot of other acres being pulled out in favor of hops right now in the Yakima Valley because of the the explosion of uh, craft brewing and continued demand for these these brands. And so um, this is a pretty pretty typical site in the springtime uh, around the northwest putting up putting up new hop yards. You see there where we got workers going through and, and planting those rhizomes. So once they Already, they've got the trellis up and they're ready to get a new field planted. They'll go through and basically just pull the dirt aside and you set the rhizomes down in with the eyes facing up. And uh, you've got crews going through uh, stringing here. So every single year, uh, people uh, go through and restring um, every single field, every single acre. So uh, this is what the, the plants actually grow up. 
So uh, you can see here a crew hanging strings every year, um, hanging down, they'll go, a group of people will go behind and, and connect those into the ground with some little metal hooks. And then physically people go out and train the hops onto those strings every year. You can see here, this is a baby yard. And uh, you can see there the one vine has been trained on the string and she's working on uh, putting that other plant onto the adjacent string. So every single year, uh, human hands plant the fields every single year, human hands train, train the plants onto the strings. It's a very labor intensive crop. Um, and so uh, a lot of people, you don't, don't really realize all the work that goes into it, but it's, a, it's not an easy crop to grow, that's to be sure. So you can see here a little later in the season, uh, different varieties you will go through and have to retrain again. Um, but they'll send crews back through and, and make sure that, that each string has, you know, depending on variety, about three to four uh, binds per string trained on there. Here's a shot uh, about this time of year in the valley. So this, uh, there's a lot of fields starting to look like this where everything's I've been trained on the strings and now, like I said, it's kind of that chance to, to exhale a little bit here between uh, the really hectic springtime activities and the remainder of the growing season. So a lot of stuff around the valley is uh, roughly looking like about this right now. And then of course, this is, uh, this is close to harvest. This is what, uh, this is what a, a full mature hop yard looks like, uh, probably in the middle of August or so, right before harvest. So then that begs the question, you know, what if you've got a bunch of new acres to plant, but uh, March 21st looks like this. And this was uh, actually last spring. So we um, unfortunately obviously couldn't go out and dig rhizomes and couldn't go out and do much of anything in the fields um, well, well into April of last year. And so we could not uh, propagate with rhizomes. And so what we really had to do a lot of last year was uh, softwood cuttings and basically taking taking uh, clean mother plants, virus-free mother plants, and taking those unrooted uh, softwood cuttings off though, and uh, dipping in, in uh, rooting hormone and starting baby, baby plantlets basically. So you can see here all those root cuttings are are dipped in the root tone and then stuck into the flats here, and we grew acres and acres of plants in greenhouses last year. Um, basically to compensate for the lack of rhizomes that we were not able to use for planting new acres. Um, and so there, there are multiple uh, propagation techni techniques for hops. Um, you know, most reliable is, like I said, using rhizomes. It's most cost-effective um, and gives the, the strongest stand in that, in that first baby year. Um, but when pressed, you, you, can, you can use alternative methods like the softwood cuttings here. So this is kind of what those finished plants look like once they get bumped up uh, from the small 72 cell flats up into uh, up into one gallon pots there. So then those pots are taken out and planted similar how a rhizome would be planted and trained on similarly uh, later on in the season. Um, here's a little uh, timeline of some of our some of our more popular brand launches over the years. I can see prior to our partnership in, in the hot breeding company, we had uh, a few commercial releases, most notably Autanum, Simcoe, um, Warrior, I'm sure a lot of you have used as well. Um, and then post uh, the merger with HBC, we've had the Citra Mosaic, Equinot, and all the way up to Sabro and Pato. Um, and we are uh, anxious and excited to be releasing another variety this year. So uh, keep, your, keep your eyes and ears open for that. Um, and once those brands are released, this is really where Yakima Chief Ranches uh, separates themselves on quality um, with, is with the Footprints program. And this is something that's, that's uh, unrivaled in our industry. You know, our, our competitors uh, are, are just starting to kind of try to emulate the, a lot of the quality assurance and quality, uh, quality care issues that we've, that we've enabled over the last uh, five or six years here. And, and really, uh, putting our money where our mouth is and scouting extensively, working on uh, virus-free plantings, uh, working on all sorts of agronomic trials and, and research studies to, to really bolster our growers and help them 
uh, achieve their goals and our collective goals of providing the, the highest quality and the world's best hops um, to all the world's finest brewers. So we take that very seriously. And, um, you know, our partners, Cryer Malt included, um, they, they understand that mentality as well and, and really strive to protect that value uh, in these brands that we've been talking about the whole time. Um, just a little background on, on the Footprints internship, you know, what we do, we, a lot of our, our scouting crew, we rely on uh, recently graduated college people uh, from all over the world um, to come in and help us uh, cover all those, those thousands of acres that, that we're now growing. So you can see there, uh, back when I started, so my first year with the company was uh, actually as an intern. It was, it was the first year of this internship. Uh, it was just me and one other fella. Uh, who is now an agronomist at uh, BT Loftus Ranches, so one, one of the best top farms in the world uh, up in Moxie. Uh, but back when we started, we were working with just a handful of growers on, on just, a, just a touch over 2,000 acres. And so just in, just in those, those years from 2013 to 2020, uh, you know, I worked with over 40 growers on over 15,000 acres all across Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. So it's a uh, Pretty impressive growth, pretty amazing uh, ride to be a part of. Uh, it's been a whole lot of fun, a whole lot of hard work, and uh, we kind of feel like we're just getting started in a way. But uh, just a lot of the other stuff that we can, that we kind of focus on there, and then as you can see there, twenty of our twenty of our former interns are are now you know, permanently employed in the hop and beer industries. Uh, and I want to give a particular shout out to our our buddy Rob Laurie, who's an Aussie, and he came and uh, interned with us last year and uh, impressed us enough that we wanted to hire him and bring him back uh, in, a, in a permanent position. So uh, the COVID kind of put a snag on things, but he is working with the consulate to uh, get a visa and Rob should be joining us up here in Yakima in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, I hope that's true because we need him. Um, but anyway, there's a little shot of uh, our 2020 class. So looking forward to getting all those kids into the fold. Uh, they all start on June 1st. And just to kind of uh, kind of tie this cycle together here and show you how it all works, you know, we are at YCR and our footprints program, kind of that the farm side of the Yakima Chief uh, supply chain and and what we work on. Um, and really, I just want to focus on you know, we've gone through on everything we do, but really focus on that other side there with the breweries and um, that being intentional about building relationships and being able to forecast and and being able to have really honest conversations. Uh, with our brewing customers about about demand and about different varieties and about utilizations and different hop technologies um, we really value those relationships with our brewing partners as i like to say it, it really is there's there's no industry without the other um, and so we really feel like in the act of chief supply chain that uh, that open dialogue and um, that ability to work with our customers directly uh, is really setting us up for continued sustainable success in both of our in both of our industries. And with that, um, I guess we'll throw it over to Blaze and save questions for later. But if you have any questions or comments or you want to send me beer or anything, uh, there's my email address. And I look forward to chatting more with you all here soon. Thanks for your time. Thanks a lot for that, Joe. Um, Blaze, while you get your uh, screen set up, um, I'll just run through what the next session is going to be. Um, but also, Joe, you're going to be in the chat if anyone has any questions. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you, which I'll fire off into the chat as well. Um, the next session we've got coming up is with Eric Fowler from White Labs. Uh, he's talking about yeast strain selection as well um, after this hop. So I think there's a lot of even more crossover with hops and yeast uh, than we ever anticipated in the last few years. So that's going to be fascinating. Um, but for now, we're going to throw to Blaze Rude. Um, Blaze, are you ready to go there? I sure hope so. Okay. Do you can want you to hear? Yeah. Can you hear me loud and clear? Can, can you see my presentation? Uh, I can't see your presentation just yet. Uh, while you do that, um, after the one with Eric Fowler, we're going to have uh, Barrett Burst and Malting coming up as well, talking about malt. So it's a really good day for education. Um, and I'm just possibly seeing your screen coming up now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to transition to that. 
Um, cool. All right, we're ready to go. All right. Uh, there we go. Looks like we're there. So uh, I'm Blaze again. Uh, just wanted to say uh, thanks again for making the time to uh, see uh, our presentation today and listen to us and uh, listen to us talk about uh, U.S. hops. So Joe covered a ton of things, uh, some of which I, you know, I, I know about and I like to talk about, but uh, really he's taking you really from the farm end and, and, and how we get uh, hops to the, uh, the merchant and the processor. So that's, that's where I come in and my team comes in. We're, we receive all these hops from all these different farms. Some of them are uh, owners of Yakima Chief Hops, some are not, but all of them focused on growing great hops and connecting with brewers. So uh, basically what happens every year at harvest is we're going to receive a bunch of hops, um, let's say 40 plus million pounds of hops for the U S crop, uh, not quite 20 million kilos, but something like that. So quite a bit. Uh, and I'm going to take you through basics of, uh, just hop processing and, uh, what's going on there. And a little bit of, uh, I have a case study with a, a brewery I've worked with. And, uh, and then I'm going to rip through these slides and open up to questions and answers. So if you've got qu questions for uh, Joe or myself, uh, we're happy to answer them. So hopefully we'll have five, 10 minutes to uh, go through that. So I'm going to go through pretty quick. When I go through this, I, I, I always like to blow up a picture of a hop cone. This is the cross section here. We have uh, what you can see uh, is the hop cone. It's comprised of a strig or a stem, which is the middle part. And then there's a bunch of these little yellow balls around that stem and the leafy vegetal material that surrounds it. So a lot of what we uh, brewers look at is uh, what's going on uh, brewing value wise with a hop when you get it. So the, those little yellow balls, those are lupulin glands, uh, the leafy material around it's mostly polyph polyphenol uh, material that is kind of protecting the lupulin gland in the field and then how we process, we utilize it to do that as well. So uh, those little yellow balls, those lupulin glands are important because they contain most of the oils, most of the aromatics and a lot of the, uh, the alpha content as well. All right, so just a little bit about a couple of things here. The fresh hops, really those are the, the hop cones in the field. Those are what are growing on the vines that then get picked and then get dried and kilned and uh, conditioned and then packed into uh, bales that we receive. I think uh, both Australia and New Zealand, you have some great hops growing down there. You're probably familiar with what the hop bales look like down there. Ours are 200 pound bales, uh, the size of a small human, but pretty heavy, densely packed bricks. We receive those in our warehouses and we store them until we can process them. So when we get them in, we, we primarily process uh, type 90 pellets, that's a, I don't know the exact percentage these days, but it's probably 80%, maybe 75% of what we receive goes to, to type 90 pellets, which is really an industry standard. Uh, we also take a, a large chunk and that goes into the cryo hop and American noble hop lines that we, uh, we also process. Additionally, we will take T90 pellets and break those down into different components. Uh, some of those are alpha, oil, beta, uh, different products. What uh, craft brewers are mostly concerned about is probably the CO2 extract part, potentially aromatic oils. All right, whole leaf hops, really basic. This comes from the farm in the bale. Not much to it uh, other than kiln dried, pressed into a brick, packed in mylar. Those are what we receive. T90 pellets, like I discussed. Uh, Industry standard, really what we take is T90 stands for type 90, meaning 90% make it into the final pellet. Ours are really more like type 95, 96, 97%. We take those bales, they get ground, they get pressed, in, well, they get ground first, then they get mixed, just homogenize the batch and they get pressed into pellets, which you receive in, in your breweries. Really, there's nothing very advanced about the process. It's a pretty crude process. It's, you know, we've been doing it for a long time in the, in the hop industry. And uh, it works well. It's uh, basically, uh, you know, you, you grind them in a hammer mill uh, and then mix and they go into a pellet mill, which I have a picture of right there on the, uh, on the slide. And all that is, is there's a form, there's rollers that pushes the, the ground leaf material through that form. And you get those pellets, which you see at the bottom right of the screen. Uh, <clears throat> one big project that I worked on when I started in the hop industry was the cryo hop project. Really the concept for this came from, uh, you know, I was a brewer 
I brewed a lot of hoppy beers and I was always driven crazy when I would dry hop the beers in the way that I would dry hop them. You know, if I got over a certain threshold, I'd get grassy, vegetal, gritty, kind of earthy notes. And I didn't like that. So cryo hop, that whole cryo hop project came from a concept uh, with my team of wanting to produce a dry hop product that you could more excessively hop the beer and avoid those grassy, gritty, earthy, vegetal notes. So our strategy to do that was to separate, um, you know, those little yellow balls, those lupian glands that are in this slide here, those ones that are around that hop cone, get them all in one place. And that's where we landed on the cryo hop process. So with that process, um, so with that process, what we're doing is we're really um, taking those bales of hops from the farms, the farms that Joe and his team work with, and uh, they go through our cryo hop process. Really what that, it's pretty simple process, um, more complex than the type 90, that we take those bale hops, we, uh, we put them through a bale breaker, which, and then a rock trap process, which, uh, and magnets to get any form material out. Then we, uh, We'll, there's a cooling step, there's a milling step, and then a separation step. And uh, with that, we're, we're separating a lot of that leafy material from the lupulin, from those little yellow glands, those little yellow balls from that first slide. And uh, with that, we're, we're keeping most of the brewing value in one place and removing a lot of that vegetal material that, um, you know, with hoppy beers, you don't really need an abundance of. Uh, one note with that is we do use uh, liquid nitrogen, which when you relieve the pressure from the liquid nitrogen, it turns to gas, uh, so and it pushes oxygen out of the system. And essentially we are in a, a nitrogen rich environment versus a oxygen rich environment in this uh, process, which helps keep the hop preserved and avoids oxidation and all sorts of other issues. Uh, really, like I said, superior aroma. We're keeping all the aroma in one place. We're avoiding oxidation and uh, we're intensifying it. Uh, we have really good temperature control. The particle size is confined based on our equipment. So you don't have large chunks uh, for some brewers. That's an issue for most, not too huge of an issue. And that brings me to yields. Um, and when I'm talking yields using cryo hops, I'm talking liquid yields. So, uh, you know, my old brew house was a 10 barrel, the US 10 barrel brew house. Uh, man, we'd lose you know, from what I brew, I brewed upwards of 10 to 11 US barrels and I'd yield about 6.8, I think was my bright tank. So on really hoppy beers, I might get less than that. So huge losses. Well, when you replace a lot of the hoppy material that's getting into the dry hop, you, you really get a lot more liquid into the finished tank. So that was one that was an unintended uh, benefit of cryo hops, of using them. Uh, and with that, um, you see the specs really average 1.8 uh, enrichment factor for alpha versus bale D for T90 and 2.2 on the oil. So we're really able to capture most of the alpha and most of the oil and uh, make it a lot more efficient in your brewing process. All right, uh, I covered all this. I'm gonna just go skip this one. Increase yields, reduce vegetal uh, polyphenol flavor. Um, real quick. I'm gonna talk about one more process we do. Uh, it's really, we take T90 hops, we go into the CO2 hop extract process. Uh, what is hop extract? Well, it's pretty much vegetal material free, uh, alpha, beta, and hop oil. It's all in one place, it's in a can, it's easy to use, uh, shelf stable. It's uh, really, the, the key piece with this is it's really primarily a kettle ingredient. And I've never really used it for dry hop. I've heard of brewers have tried and struggle with it but it works great on the hot side. So depending on your recipe, it's a, it's a really good option. It's shelf stable and uh, does a lot of good things. So how do we make it? Uh, basically we take type 90 pellets from one of our type 90 lines. And we have type 90 and we have extract pellets. They're really pretty close. There's not much process. But we take those pellets uh, and we put them into high pressure vessels and we infuse them with supercritical CO2. Supercritical CO2 is CO2 that is in a supercritical state, which means it's at a certain pressure and temperature. Uh, you can see that on this graph. What's key about that is the CO2 is really uh, 
possessing properties of both liquid and gas in that state. And it's very efficient at point, pulling out oil and resin. And uh, with that, you can pump it from one tank to another and leave the vegetable material behind and get it out of the equation so that you, the brewer, aren't dealing with uh, leafy material. Uh, so that's what that process is. And again, extended shelf life, really good utilization. I mean, you got the vegetable material out uh, on an alpha basis. You know, you're going to be usually, depending on the beer, 5% more efficient at summarizing the alpha from CO2 a hop extract than you are with type 90. Um, Increased brew house yields, there's really no uh, addition to TREB when you use this product. And uh, there's one other benefit that not many people think about. Uh, me as a brewer, you know, and I, when I got into it and was research, researching this and how I get this product into my beers is, you know, I used to use a lot of firm cap to control boil over. This actually, if you use it for your bittering addition, helps with that as well. And then you're not adding like an adjunct product or something that's a, a different chemical. Really, all this is is hops and CO2. And then really the CO2 is flashed off. So you don't really even have CO2 in the finished package. All you really have is this nice syrupy extract that uh, when used right is very effective. All right, real quick case study that we have. Uh, did one uh, with, with Frame I wanted to highlight. Uh, my friend Gavin, he was kind of spearheaded it with them. We, what we did was we used the same uh, bale lots from the farms and we produced cryohop and T90 pellets. So same hops produced two different pellets and they brewed the same beer, but hopped it a little bit differently. Uh, basic recipe specs were 6.8 ABV was the uh, target, 60 IBU was the target. Grain bill was super basic, uh, mostly two row pale, were Chinook, Mosaic and Citra. As far as the variation I'll show you on the next screen is really, we kept the Chinook consistent uh, and just swapped out some of the Citra and Mosaic with uh, Cryo. So kept the bulk of the T90 load in there and uh, replace some of the T90 with, uh, with Cryo hops. So doing this, here's the breakdown you can see on the T90 recipe, which is uh, kind of the standard, uh, I wanna say it was three turns on their brew house, uh, but used. And then we did a cryohop T90 uh, replacement. We were able to remove about 35% of the vegetal material from the, from the entire batch, which uh, was interesting to do. And so what were we doing really? We were in the same beer two different ways with a little bit of a tweak on the hops uh, to see what the sensory difference was. Uh, what we did see, which we weren't necessarily expecting, but we were kind of onto from my trial brews was what is the, the VDK implications? So I'm talking diastole and diastole precursor. How is it different uh, by pulling out a bunch of that vegetable material? And by a bunch, I mean kind of it. You know, you, you can see right here, here's the specs on the beer. Uh, really overall, less VDK production and um, you know, it was able to reduce and stay stable. Whereas the, uh, the T90 recipe had more VDK, uh, so more diacetyl and a little more time to, to clean up. Uh, so their processing efficiency wise, there is an advantage, in my opinion, using cryo as part of your uh, dry hop in particular. I think if you replace the, the flame out, you're not going to see much of a VDK difference. But when you're talking about dry hop and hop creep, you will. So uh, I would, if you're having issues with tanks that are taking too long to clear VDK, I recommend cryo as a potential uh, option to help you with that. So that's uh, just some of the data that Freeman countered. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. There was a little bit of difference of bitterness. We had uh, of the wort to the fermenter. The T90 actually initially was higher. The cryo was uh, at 130 on brew day, the T90 at 143. Uh, for those of you who don't know, what it, your, your IBU tested uh, on brew day versus once it's fermented, you're gonna see a big reduction. So you can see that in these numbers. The T90 from brew day to final beer was 58. So very close to our 60 target. The cryo and T90 version was 130 on brew day and 61. So we're seeing a, probably a little bit more stability when cryo is used. And, uh, you know, we hit our targets, they look good, but it's just interesting to see how, you know, the T90 maybe degraded a little bit more. Uh, so you can see those bitterness and how that's tracked there. Um, sensory results, 
Flavor match was really close. Cold source samples uh, were definitely preferred. Uh, and we did sensory with both Frame and with Yakima Chief staff and our sensory team. And the cryohop samples were slightly preferred, but the flavor match was really close. And, you know, the polyphenol test, I don't know exactly the test method, but I know that the, uh, the cryo did, as the graph shows, test a little bit lower, as you would expect, because you have less vegetable material in there. So that's what I have on that case study. And uh, really everything went, went good. I think uh, depending on your brew house, depending on your size, cryo is a really good tool to brew the beers how you want to brew them and potentially increase yields. Uh, I found the smaller the brew house, the more significant it is. If you have a large brew house with advanced separation equipment, you might not see as much of a yield benefit. Whereas uh, smaller brew houses, especially with loads, you're going to see probably a huge benefit. So I'd recommend trying it out. That's what I have. And I'd like to open it up to question and answers now. Um, so I think we've got a little bit of time left. Sorry, I was muted there and didn't realize. Um, just speaking um, regarding that hop trial, uh, members of the IBA can access uh, the frame side of that, that trial. Um, they presented it to BrewCon last year. Um, so sign into the website and go through resources and, and members can see um, all the information about that, uh, which, is, which is really good. Um, we don't have any questions coming through. Uh, Blaze, what's your email address in case anyone has any more questions? Because um, this will be live for uh, um, you know indefinitely, so people can come along later on and check it out. So, um, what's your email address? It's uh, it's my name, Blaze dot Rude. So B L A Z E dot R U U D at Yakima Chief dot com. Great, great. Um, thank you so much, Blaze. Um, and Joe, for your time, uh, as I said, we, we probably need to whip away pretty quickly for the next one, um, which will be Eric Fowler from White Labs. Um, so big shout out to the, the Yakima Chief guys for um, doing this when what is their evening um, and their downtime. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, look forward to uh, hopefully um, seeing you guys out here maybe next year sometime. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Luke.